my topic for today is uh, intrahingoidal disease, mainly surgical management, open surgical revascularization. So, peripheral arterial occlusive disease, uh, it's a spectrum of disease, uh, uh, ranging from asymptomatic to claudicans or uh, chronic uh, limb threatening ischemia. And if not treated at the right time, may lead to limb loss, leading to impaired quality of life or even death. And over the years, uh, open surgical revascularization has come to, uh, <coughs> continued to evolve and has improved very much. And still, it is a most durable. Option for intrainguinal revascularization. So, uh, the main indications are uh, uh, claudicans, who are mainly disabling uh, with their uh, uh, lifestyle limiting claudication. Uh, they constitute approximately only one third of the population of PAOD. And surgical revascularization is offered only after giving the best medical therapy for them. Uh, after lifestyle modification as smoking cessation and <clears throat> and once the uh, the clinical deterioration risk is more then we offer the revascularization and or else the chronic limb threatening ischemia which is defined as a persistent ischemic pain uh, requiring opiate analgesia or having tissue loss like ulceration or gangrene for at least 2 weeks of duration or gangrene for at least 2 weeks with an duration. ankle systolic pressure of less than 50 and toe systolic pressure of less than 30 millimeters of mercury. And over the years, many classifications uh, have evolved, initially starting from Fontaine classification and Rutherford classification, which uh, mainly describe only the pain and tissue loss, either major or minor loss, followed by task classification, task one and task two classification, which uh, focus primarily on arteriographic anatomy without uh, uh, considering the ischemia or the infection status of the limb and recently the SPS Wi-Fi classification has come into work which uh, uh, includes the wound ischemia and foot infection and all the three components have got their own 0 1 2 3 uh, grades and like this wound uh, uh, zero grade is uh, having no answer one having small ulcer shallow ulcer two concerning to have deep ulcer or a uh, Three concerning uh, exposure of the bone and ischemia also depending on the ankle brachial index or ankle systolic pressure or toe pressure and, and the transcutaneous oxygen measurement is also graded into 0, 1, 2, and 3, as well as the foot infection also, uh, like 0 concern, no infection, 1 uh, localized infection, and 2 uh, slightly extending but no systemic involvement, and 3 is the severe infection with systemic symptoms. So overall, uh, as we classify any malignancy like a uh, TNM classification, it all like uh, included all this wound, foot infection, and ischemia all together combined. Uh, it will be looked together uh, whether uh, it is graded into zero and one, two, three, and four uh, stages, where one would benefit the most benefit from revascularization, two from moderate benefit and uh, three stage three be, uh, has low benefit for re from revascularization and uh, stage four has highest state of amputation and questionable benefit of revascularization and stage four uh, it almost uh, have a 50 percent chance of amputation rates and recently global limb anatomic staging system has come uh, which includes which is anatomical staging system including the femoropopliteal uh, infrapopliteal and inframalleolar or the pedal arch configuration. And this is the picture showing the femoropopliteal segment, staging 0 to 4, and infrapopliteal segment 0 to 4, and inframalleolar. Either it is a complete, uh, if the arch is formed, it is considered as P0, and uh, if the arch is only incompletely formed, it is considered to be P1, and uh, both, uh, if no artery is crossing the ankle, it is considered as P2. And again, like similar to Wi Fi classification, it is all grouped together to stage it into uh, stages one, two, and three. Uh, so, uh, so uh, technical failure and one year 
revascularization rates are more in stage one, and 50 to 70 percent in stage two, and less than 50 percent in stage three. So, when the, once the patient uh, is clinically diagnosed with the chronic limb threatening ischemia, and he, if he is considered for revascularization, uh, initially re imaging is done, followed by the uh, all the femoropopliteal, intrapopliteal, and intramalleolar our target arteries are marked uh, after a uh, high quality imaging, and followed by the uh, the choice of uh, intervention, either endovascular or open surgical intervention, is decided. And along with when it is combined with uh, limbs, uh, Wi-Fi staging as as well as a glass staging, uh, they have devised a, a simple thing which which can, Clinically, we can say whether the patient patient will benefit from a revascularization or he will end up in amputation. And for pre-op assessment, once the patient uh, uh, is seen in the OPD, after the complete physical examination of the limb and pulses, uh, he is sent for the non-invasive tests like ankle brachial index uh, or the Doppler test, followed by if the uh, ankle brachial index is norm abnormal. Then the toe pressure in case, especially in diabetics, toe pressure is used, and followed by which the Wi-Fi staging is done for the patient to decide on revascularization. And if he is uh, decided for revascularization, then uh, imaging is obtained. Imaging either it can be done by Doppler or CT angiogram or MR angiogram. Uh, CT angiogram is not very much useful for those. Uh, who have intrapoptic disease or those in heavy, heavily calcified vessels like in diabetes. Uh, so, in case of any, uh, uh, if the vessels are not properly visualized and diagnostic arteriography is always the gold standard, if not contraindicated. And so, once the patient is planned for revascularization, uh, careful assessment of the extent of arterial disease and the uh, inflow and outflow arteries should be. Uh, decided and based on which the endovascular open surgical options are decided and selection of the suitable target arteries must be planned well before and we should we always be uh, uh, we should not always take only one one uh, inflow as the uh, inflow in mind but have other uh, uh, alternative options should always be available and during the same Pre-op assessment, the vein availability and quality is decided, and we should always anticipate and carefully consider various alternatives and complications during the construction of the uh, bypass. And all these patients with chronic limb-threatening ischemia are assumed to have significant coronary artery disease, and incidence of perioperative MI is two to six point four percent. After any revascularization of the lower limbs, and most common cause of death is also due to coronary artery disease. Almost seventy percent of them die due to coronary artery disease, and and further cardiac evaluation is only done if the patient is having significant symptoms like frequent or unstable angina, recent myocardial infarction, or poorly controlled heart failure, critical aortic stenosis, or untreated arrhythmia. And all the medical comorbidities are optimized, like blood sugar, blood pressure controls, anti-anginal regimens, or uh, heart failure medications are optimized. And there is no in patients who are having stable cardiac symptoms. There is no benefit of uh, uh, prior cardiac revascularization uh, uh, before the lower limb bypass. And and uh, this uh, plan is a mnemonic which. Uh, is a framework of uh, clinical decision making uh, in these patients with uh, chronic limb threatening ischemia, especially intra disease. Plan stands for patient risk estimation, limb staging, and AN stands for anatomic pattern of the disease. So when the patient is diagnosed, so he is staged into Wi-Fi stage, and once he stages, if he, if he is a patient for revascularization, then we must estimate the procedural risk or the two-year survival of the patient. And 
followed by which uh, if his patient is fit for surgery, then he is uh, staged according to glass classification, and depending on which uh, option of endovascular or open surgical bypass is determined. Various stratification models have been uh, used, like FinVAS, Prevent3, and Basel models. Uh, the FinVAS uh, stratification model uses diabetes mellitus, foot gangrene, coronary artery disease, or uh, need for urgent operation. And Prevent3 uh, model uses dialysis, tissue loss, age more than 75 years, or CAD. Uh, these both FinVAS can Prevent3 or validated, but uh, Basel is a much complex model which is not very useful in day-to-day -day practice. And so uh, planning for the surgical revascularization should always anticipate and uh, consider numerous alternative options and potential complications. And major anatomic lesions, significant lesions must be identified prior. And also if, uh, when performing an infraingvenal bypass, uh, check for the concomitant in inflow disease, especially in the iliac arteries, must be taken care of. And patients who are only claudicans with no tissue loss or rest pain, uh, correcting this inflow a problem would, would be sufficient in most of the patients. And profunda popliteal collateral index is also useful in patients with multiple lesions, and it is helpful uh, whether the inflow procedure alone will be sufficient or a profanoplasty is also required. It is, if it is greater than 0.2, it is measured by a bony uh, pressure, by below knee pressure, by a bony pressure. And if it is more than 0.25, uh, it indicates a uh, significant pressure gradient across the knee joint. So, uh, inflow disease, and also uh, it requires a bypass infraingvenal bypass procedure. So the proximal anastomotic site need not always be the common femoral artery. It can be the uh, from the profunda popliteal or even infra popliteal tibial vessels can also act as a uh, proximal anastomotic site. And studies have shown that the uh, almost similar results of patency when using the uh, inflow arteries other than the CFA. So uh, during the intraoperative procedure, uh, the Intratel pressure uh, measurements must be can be measured in case of any doubt of uh, before establishing a good inflow. So it can be measured by intraarterial blood pressure, uh, which is compared to the intraarterial radial pressure. And if the gradient is more than 10 mm, or uh, after giving intraarterial papaverin, if it is the drop in pressure is more than 15 percent, uh, it is significant. So there might be a more uh, proximal lesion which must be tackled before performing the distal bypass. So during the harvest of the beans, uh, careful uh, use of the uh, side branches can be used. Uh, and they can be, after, after doing a uh, patch closure, it can be uh, used as the inflow, inflow side. And associated femoral and endotrectomy can also be should also be done when the CFA is used as the inflow. The endotrectomy usually it uh, begins in the common femoral artery, uh, and it is carried out into the profunda femoris beyond the posterior uh, aspect of the tongue of the disease, which is extending into the profunda femoris. And if needed, any uh, tacking sutures must also be taken to prevent any raising of the flap. The arteriotomy can be uh, closed with the and attractomized SFA, or uh, it, must be, it can be closed with a patch, uh, like shown here. It is called a Linton's patch. From after closing a patch, the inflow is taken from the same patch, or uh, using a side uh, vein, which which is helpful in uh, increasing the uh, diameter of the anastomosis. The distal anastomotic site. Uh, determination requires more greater judgment, and it can also be uh, the general principle is always to bypass all the significant disease and to insert the bypass into the most proximal artery which uh, supplies the foot, whether it can be either of the pedal arteries. In 
case, there is no intrapopletal outflow, but there is only a say, isolated popletal artery. Even then, uh, uh, in that cases, the bypass can be uh, landed over the isolated popletal artery. Such bypasses also function uh, well. In case of uh, if the patient is having a tissue loss or a rest pain, restoring pedal pulse is very important to for the he healing of the wounds. Operative exposure, uh, the standard exposure uh, is to of the CFA is a vertical incision given overlying the CFA. And if the inflow artery is supposed to be the profunda femoris, a lateral uh, incision is usually taken. In case of a scarred groin or a redo groin, uh, various other approaches like anterior medial or posterior medial approaches can be taken to avoid the scarred groin. And uh, usually the uh, uh, bilone or ebony popliteal arteries or the posterior tibial are usually exposed uh, medial approach. And peroneal artery is, can also be approached medially, but can also be approached laterally after excising a segment of the fibula. The choice of the conduit, it can be either autogenous or uh, prosthetic. Autogenous uh, conduit options include the G uh, great softness vein, short softness vein, femoral vein, the arm veins like uh, basilic and cephalic vein, and endarterectomy segments of the superficial femoral artery, a cryopreserved vein, or even the radial artery are also have been used. Prosthetic graft most commonly used is PTFE with or without a distal cuff. Others are dacron, heparin bonded dacron, human umbilical vein, or expanded PTFE. PTFE is the most commonly used prosthetic conduit. Uh, in the abony position, it is not superior to dacron, which is shown by a study by Devine et al. And for the bypasses that insert below the knee, uh, vein cuffs. Uh, a significant patency advantage. Um, it's almost like 40 52 percent with, with cuff and 29 percent without cuff, and also it improves the limb salvage rate. If uh, there is no vein after thorough search, a PTFE with a distal anastomotic modifications is an acceptable choice. And most common uh, modification of the cuff or Miller cuff, which is an end to end anastomosis, and the Taylor patch. Or and uh, Saint Mary's boot, which in, uh, which combines both the techniques of Miller cell as well as the Taylor patch. Human umbilical vein is less commonly used. It is uh, difficult to handle, and there's a uh, concerns about subsequent endoscopic degeneration. There are no prospective trial set. And heparin bonded PTFE uh, is a substance called as Carmera bioactive surface, uh, which uh, Appears to prevent early graft thrombosis. And even the, with heparin bonded PTFE, long term studies are needed. And uh, heparin induced thrombocytopenia is also rarely reported. And if you compare the various graphs, the human umbilical vein uh, with PTFE has been inconclusive. The addition of rings to PTFE uh, did not give any benefit. And there is no advantage to heparin bonded dacron. Uh, the benefit was only seen only in short term, but not in long term use. And bypass technique, it can be either used uh, the reverse, non-reverse, or in situ conduit. Uh, and there are no uh, different significant differences uh, depending on the of the whatever method is used. It only mainly depends on the choice of the surgeon. And uh, reverse wind bypass. Uh, before uh, starting a pre-op duplex vein wrapping must be done uh, to prevent the OP itself after seeing the patient and, and the cephalofemoral junction at the fossa of follies must be uh, identified just to ensure that the the vein which we are harvesting is the true GSV rather than some other anterior or uh, medial branch. Once the trunk is exposed, uh, we can just uh, uh, expose it. Uh, with a blade or a scissors, and the side branches are meticulously ligated, and and on opening the vein must be uh, a good vein appears bluish and transparent in color, and a phlebatic vein 
it appears uh, white and rubbery in texture. And any vein spasm, uh, if you suspect any vein spasm, it can be treated with local papaverin or lidocaine. And sufficient length of the vein must be harvested. And the, preferably the vein after harvesting, it must be flushed with chilled autolocus blood added with uh, heparin and papaverin. And if uh, the vein must be dilated only gently to avoid injury to the endothelium. And any small missed branches must be repaired preferably with a 6O or 7O proline. And proper uh, timing of the harvest of the vein is important to result in minimal uh, vein exposure to atmosphere. And while tunneling, uh, the main important thing is to avoid any rotational twist in the graft and also the plane of the graft. It can be the subcutaneous or intramuscular or intrafacial. Um, and also the other uh, things during the harvest of the vein, are, it is uh, preferable to leave some short skin bridges in order to, uh, to avoid creation of long skin flaps. If the GSV or SSV is not available, then the next best option is to uh, harvest the upper arm veins. But uh, the upper arm veins are more fragile and they're more difficult to harvest. And they frequently harbor abnormal segments having uh, some sinicae or webs, which are uh, again with mid dealt with. And angioscopy can be useful to uh, see any such lesions inside the veins. Uh, in situ vein bypass, the main advantage for this bypass is the vein artery size match, which is optimized to this technique. But uh, it must be used uh, after distending of the vein, a valve toe must be used, uh, which must be passed from distal to the proximal and to lyse all the vein walls. The first proximal wall must be. Uh, Cut with a directly under vision with a power, some pot scissor. And so the proximal and distal segments of GSV are mobilized and uh, at the sites of the uh, sites of the anastomosis. And the most proximal wall must be excised, and uh, the the entire length of the graph must be sequentially uh, screened for any branches uh, while. Uh, Starting from proximal to distally, the vein is screened with a Doppler after compressing the vein. If there is a continuous flow, there's a, it means that there's a branch is present and the, vein, the, the branch must be ligated. And after the perform, performing the bypass, it's a very important to uh, confirm the uh, distal pulse or whether it can be, uh, if, if it is the peroneal artery, it can be the screen with Doppler artery or a completion angiography can be done or duplex scanning or angioscopy can be done, which is rarely performed. So graft patency, reversed vein versus in situ bypass graft. So the, uh, the results are almost similar, except the 3 mm veins, uh, less than 3 mm veins, the in situ bypass is much better. And if you see the patients uh, who are claudicans, for whom uh, abony bypass and baloney bypass was done, the results are much better with the vein than for prosthetic graft. But in uh, critical limb ischemia, in abony, uh, vein is better in both abony and baloney, and prosthetic graft is inferior to both. Uh, this is it. basal trial is the landmark study. Uh, comparing bypass versus angioplasty in severe uh, ischemia of the leg. The main conclusions from this study are patients who lived more than two years after randomization, a bypass first was associated with significant increase in subsequent survival and amputation free survival. And durability depends on the choice of initial revascularization being the uh, open surgical being better than endovascular. And those who receive prosthetic grafts, they are more, they underwent more amputation than those who receive vein grafts. And who underwent bypass surgery after an initial failed angioplasty experienced worse amputation uh, rate 
than those who went bypass first. And those patients with severe limb ischemia and long segment uh, disease, uh, and who have a life expectancy of at least two years, are better served to be an open bypass rather than uh, endovascular procedure. And various uh, functional outcomes like a patent graft, heal wound, and no need for reoperation. And various studies have been done. It showed that uh, only a small fraction of the patients uh, are totally satisfied after the revascularization. And there are a few objective performance goals given by the uh, Society of Vascular Surgery. Um, based on the, the data is collected from the PREVENT-3 basal trial and cyclist trial. And so uh, it has shown that in high risk groups, major adverse limb events and major adverse cardiac events are more in high risk groups. Post operative management, usually antiplatelets are prescribed either aspirin or clopidogrel. And clopidogrel is associated with much more bleeding risk than aspirin. Aspirin can be given from 81 to 325 milligrams. And uh, anticoagulation, uh, it is not given routinely. A trial, from, uh, BOA trial, which has uh, which says that anticoagulation is better in uh, vein grafts and uh, antiplatelets are shown to be have good results in uh, gra prosthetic grafts. And regular management, optimal management of the wound care by offloading and modification of the footwear need to be done. And complications are early, is most common is a uh, myocardial infarction, it is also the most common cause of death and major amputation, graft occlusion, uh, graft hemorrhage, and death in 2.57% of the patients. Late complications include persistent lymphedema, graft infection, graft aneurysm, and graft stenosis. And early graft occlusion, the most common causes are technical, namely anastomotic, local endotrectomy, or uh, clam defects, or either it can be with a uh, valve defects in the vein, or poor conduit quality, or the in inadequate outflow. So while exploring for early graft occlusion, the distal anastomosis should be uh, uh, suspected of the culprit first and should be explored, followed by uh, which an arteriogram done to the exact site of the lesion. And a uh, gentle thrombectomy can be attempted with a uh, Fogarty catheter, followed by which, uh, if it is not successful, then the proximal anastomotic site uh, need to be dealt with. And late graft occlusion, uh, they are difficult to treat, and they are they, they should be treated only if a uh, patient is significantly symptomatic. And options include thrombolysis with or without mechanical thrombectomy. However, the results are poor in late graft, graft occlusion, and if the patient is symptomatic, may need uh, the graft to be replaced, preferably uh, via an alternative route. And followed by following a successful bypass surgery, graft surveillance is very important for the long-term success. Nearly one-third of the vein grafts develop lesions that uh, threaten graft patency and need to be dealt with. And during the first two years, it is mainly due to intimal hyperplasia, and later on, the inflow and outflow lesions develop. And uh, uh, regular angle brachial pressure index and duplex surveillance are important and and on routine screening if the focal lesions associated with peak systolic velocity of more than 300 centimeters per second or a velocity ratio of greater than 3.5 to 4 may need even though the patient is asymptomatic may need a prophylactic repair either uh, endovascular or open and graphs that develop uh, uh, that, that show a decrease in velocities over time should also undergo articulography to detect the exact site of lesion and nature of lesion. Most of the graft and anastomotic stenosis are solitary and focal in almost 80% of the cases. The treatment depends on the length of the lesion, the timing of its occurrence, and the patient's fitness for surgery. Then if the endovascular approach is choose, chosen, uh, cutting or a scoring balloon are used in, uh, because the lesions are, uh, there's a intimal hyperplasia and uh, 
Mm. The reasons are very uh, difficult to dilate with a normal balloon. And if the open procedure is uh, chosen, an interposition graft or a mean plus angioplasty can be done. Or in case there is an inflow obstruction uh, with no uh, conduit or distal outflow uh, abnormality, the uh, proximal anastomosis can be translocated to a different location. So the key points are patient selection is important. Uh, always choose a being all autogenous palsy, either it is a is a, either a bony or bony position. For intragenically incessant sites, uh, PTFE, if if we need to choose a prosthetic graft, PTFE with distal anastomotic modification, like a cuff must be done. And regardless of uh, type of conduit use, meticulous surgical technique is critical and long-term follow-up is essential. Thank you.